like I shared last week, I, I got to, to, to give the message. And, you know, Monday morning, I walked into the office, and, like, I thought I was going to breathe easy, but it was almost like last week just didn't stop. Because for me, let me just be honest with you, for me, it takes me about 72 hours around the clock to prepare a sermon. For Larry and Pastor Ed, what takes me 72 hours may take you, what, like an hour, two hours, three hours, something like that. So, um, so I walked into the office on Monday morning and I was like, you know, kind of just walked in and I was like, I got to speak again on Sunday. And reality struck me and I, I said, God, what do I speak about? And... Uh, You know, I almost felt like God nudged me and kind of encouraged me to share something of a personal message. So I was like, okay, personal message, that sounds good. Maybe I'll share my testimony, which I will in just a couple minutes. But but beyond that, what do you want me to speak on? Like, do I open my Bible? And I just like, that's what I'm going to speak on. So so I started thinking about it. And I, I thought about some of the stories in Scripture, some of the passages in Scripture that speak to me personally, that I can relate to. And the story that came to mind was the story of the prodigal son. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's in your bulletin. Um, I think I printed enough for everybody. So uh, we're going to talk about the story of the prodigal son. So the way I go about my studying during the week is generally what I'll do is I'll I'll find the the scripture. I'll print it out in context. So I'll have like three pages of of scriptures on my desk. And I'll kind of just read through it and highlight different things, different phrases that stick out to me. And... uh, and so I looked at this, this passage, the prodigal son, and I was like, really, God, you want me to speak on this? I mean, come on, let's, let's be serious. How many of you remember what we spoke about last week? There was a key phrase that we focused on a little bit last week. We spoke on compassion, right? But there was a phrase. It, it said that Jesus saw the people, he saw the crowd, and that he had compassion on them. And he saw their deeper need, and he, he felt it. It, was, it, was, it, it. it made his insides turn, knowing what they were struggling with, knowing what they were going through. So I had this, the, the, the prodigal son passage on my desk, and I kind of just looked at it, perused it over, and my eyes kind of went to this phrase. In verse 20, it said, his father saw his son, his father saw him, and he felt compassion. You want to talk about revelation? God, do I really need to speak on this? Yes. Here you go. So I, I want to give you a sermon today. I want to share a message with you entitled, The Father's Heart. And really, if there's one thing I want you to come away with today, it's a simple bottom line. Maybe for some of us it's a reminder. Maybe for some of us it's something you've never really heard before, never really know. It's the fact that God loves you. God loves you. I just want to remind somebody today that God loves you immeasurably. He loves you, and not only does he love you, but he has compassion. He does something about his love for you. He has compassion on you. That's what compassion does, right? It does something. It's not just a feeling. It's not just an emotion. It does something about the need. God loves you. He looks on you with compassion. He does something about his love for you. The scripture talks on and on. Actually, that's a recurring theme throughout scripture is God's love for his people. The psalmist says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and he's abounding in steadfast love. John says this, greater love has no one than this, than someone would lay his life down for his friends. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? Let me tell you where I come from. I know a lot of you guys might know my personal story, but some of you don't. You see, my parents, I was raised in a, in a wonderful home. Godly parents, people who raised me in church, who taught me Christian values. But to be honest with you, for most of my childhood into my middle teen years, I kind of lived my faith through them like I lived my parents' faith. I went with them to church. I put on a good front, but I didn't really come to know the Lord personally until I was 15, 16 years old. How many of you know life isn't always perfect after you come to know the Lord? Because my later teen years were incredibly difficult. I kind of walked away from God a little bit, even though I kept on going to church. That doesn't mean you're, you're you're doing the right thing if you're going to church. I mean, it's awesome that you go to church, but it's not always the right thing. I was going to church, and, but I, I, I could put on a front like no other. My parents saw it. I'd, I'd go home, and I mean, on various occasions, my parents would call me aside and say, Ernie, we need to talk, and I knew it was a difficult thing. I knew, I knew, I knew it was about to come, and they wouldn't always yell at me, but they would speak to me strongly, and I'll never forget, I might forget the actual theme of the conversation or the, 
the reason they, they wanted to talk to me. But one thing I'll never forget is those conversations, they always weaved in there the fact that they'll always love me. No matter what, we'll always love you. The moments I rebelled, the moments I slighted my mom or my dad, the moments I it clearly and almost intentionally hurt them, I could remember them sharing compassion with me. Let's fix this, Ernie. Let's do something about this. Let me, let me help you walk through this. They had compassion on me. And I believe that's the same. That, for me, kind of mirrored, yes, what godly parents look like, but also what a godly father looks like. All right. Well, let's read this story, the, the, the greatest short story ever told. And as we read it, I almost want you to try to kind of enter, enter Jesus' teaching. I want you to kind of picture yourself there as, as Jesus is teaching these people. It says this, Luke chapter 15, 11 to 24, you could read along in your bullets, and it says, and Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share or this share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between his two sons. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took to a, a far country, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless or loose living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in, in need. The scripture says he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17 Verse 17, this is a pivotal moment in this passage. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And here I am starving. So I will arise, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So would you treat me as one of your hired servants? And so... He rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion on him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Isn't that what God does for us? And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father. My favorite three word phrase in the Bible, my favorite two word phrase in the Bible, but God, but the father. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. So Jesus is sitting and eating with these tax collectors and these sinners, the scripture tells us, the, the immoral and irreligious. He's sitting with them and he's eating with them and these these Pharisees, these, these scribes and these Pharisees kind of see this meeting and they, uh, they start to mumble amongst themselves. Can you believe what he's doing? He's actually dining with these people? You know what that means, right? He considers them his brothers and his sisters. How could he do that? And so Jesus kind of wants to teach them a lesson about who he values and what he values. And he starts to teach them using these three parables. Parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the last one, the parable of the prodigal son. And really, there's one key theme that kind of underlies those three parables. It's God's love for his lost children and the joy he experiences when they return. So the people hearing this would have substituted that father for God. They would have substituted the younger son for tax collectors and sinners, and the, the older son would have been the scribes and the Pharisees. I'm not going to talk about the older son today. I want to focus on God's immense and measurable love for us. How many of you know that God loves you this morning? How many of you need to be reminded that God loves you this morning? We're going to, the way I put to, this sermon together was a little different. What we're going to do is we're going to look at chunks of the, this story and kind of apply it to our lives as we go along. So verse 12 to 16 tells us that this son goes to his father and says, Father, give me my share of the property. You know, the listeners that of those days would have said to themselves, man, this son is a, well, to be honest, he's a little bit of a jerk. He's saying to his dad, dad, I, I wish you were dead. I don't want to wait for, for you to die. I wish you were dead. Give me, give me what's coming to me already, excuse me. 
It was an unthinkable, a, a cold request. It was legal, but it wasn't loving on his part. Because I believe he saw his earthly possessions as more valuable than re- his relationship with his father. I think oftentimes we fall into that trap also. Where we see our earthly possessions as more valuable than our relationship with the Lord. This isn't meant to convict you. It's meant to challenge us, to make us think a little bit. And so this younger son kind of humiliated his father with this request before the rest of the villagers. This father would have been looked at as, like, what? Are you allowing your son to ask you that question? Seriously? But his father nonetheless allowed him to make his own choice and go his own way. Because oftentimes, I think we learn the hard way, don't we? He knew if his son was ever going to learn, he was going to have to go off on his own and learn the hard way. So his son gathers all he had. The, the phrase there in the Greek would have been he, he took his property, his wealth, his cattle, whatever his father gave him, and he turned it into cash. And he went to a faraway country. He left nothing behind that might tie him back to his father's home. Kind of a sad story, isn't it? The first thing I want to look at is rebellion. The phrase there is he went to a far away country, to a far country. While he was in that far country, the scripture tells us that he squandered his property. It's almost like he took everything he had and he just threw it up into the wind and wherever it landed, it landed. He squandered it on reckless and and loose living, likely immoral behavior, just silly stuff. It would have been considered a great offense to the Jewish people that day for a son to squander their their property. And it certainly would have been grounds for excommunication. Then two disasters hit this kid at once. He ran out of money, which was his fault, right? And then a famine hit the land. No fault of his own, but certainly increased his difficulty out there. So at this point, nobody's going to help him. You see, famine causes people to be in need themselves, right? It would have been expensive to buy food, and it would have been in short supply. So I could imagine this young man going from house to house. Hey, I need food. Going to his friends. Hey, I need food. I can't help you, man. I got to help myself and my family first. So he finds himself lacking, the scripture says, even the basics of life. And he's forced to find work. He had to take what he can get, and he finds himself feeding pigs. It's disgusting work. Jewish people under normal circumstances wouldn't have touched a pig. But you see, I believe his decisions ultimately led him to despair. When we make poor decisions, a lot of times it leads us to despair. He finds himself in the lowest possible position, tending to pigs, longing to eat their slop. The next phrase I want to look at is when he came to himself. He came to himself. The scripture says, but when he came to himself... He said to himself, how many of my father's servants have bread to eat? And here I am starving. I'm going to rise. I'm going to go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he came to himself, and then finally he rose and, and came to his father. How many of you know it would have just been remorse if he, if he would have sat there and said, man, I, I messed up. I messed up. I messed up, I think I need to go to my father, I'll rise, I'll go, and I'll, I'll say to him, but, but the fact that he arose and went to his father shows that he went from remorse to repentance. From remorse to repentance. And that's the second part I want to look, look at. That phrase, he came to himself, which tells me he wasn't really himself up to this point. You see, I believe sin has a way of kind of blinding us and paralyzing us from what God has really called us to be, doesn't it? It really does. He'd become disillusioned by the stuff in this faraway land. It it blinded him. It placed scales on his eyes. And finally, he finds himself in a pig pen. Why is it that it always takes a pig pen for us to come to ourselves? It really does. I know for me it did. And the scales start falling off of his eyes, and he begins to see his position. He comes face to face with the facts. Isn't that what hardship does to us? It makes us come face to face with the facts of where we really are. And in his mind, he starts contrasting, oh my goodness, look where I am, I'm starving here. When I could be with my father and have everything I need. Even his dad's hired servants had more than he had. He was hungry, so he said to himself, I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. And in his mind, he plans this classic confession. I know I used to do this with my parents all the time. I'd go out, I'd do something wrong, and on my drive home, I'd say, I know exactly what I'm going to say. I remember one time I came home real late, 
real, real late, really late. Mom and dad were sitting on the couch, and I already had my speech ready to go. And the second I walked in the door, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mom, dad, I'm sorry. You know what they did? Nothing. He planned a, a classic confession. He said, I'm, I'm sorry, Dad. I know I've sinned against heaven. How many of you know that sin first is against God before anyone else? And I've also sinned against you. He realized he forfeited all claim to be called a son. And only looked for the possibility of paid work. I want to earn it back. I want to earn my position back. Let's look at that next phrase. He rose and came to his father. He rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He felt compassion. He ran. He embraced him. The son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me one of your hired servants. And the father says to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. I don't get this part. It just makes no sense to me. One, one, uh, one pastor I listened to calls this scandalous grace because it really is. He didn't deserve it. But the father says, hey, bring the best robe, put it on him. Bring my robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet. Go kill that, that calf and let's, let's celebrate. Let's have a party because my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. The last part of this outline I want to look at is rejoicing. He came to his father. While he was still a long way off, the scripture says, his father saw him. He felt compassion on him and he ran to him. The way I picture it is this dad, ever since his son left, was every morning would go out to his wraparound porch and look out into the distance, hoping his son would return. And every day he'd see people pass, no, that's not him, man. No, that's not him. And, and finally he sees a silhouette of somebody in the, in the distance that kind of looks like it could be his son. He kind of takes one step closer and he's like, is that him? Is that him? Comes off his porch and he starts to do one of those slow, dramatic dra jogs towards, his, towards who he thinks is his son. Finally, he realizes it's him, and he runs to him. And running, you know, running was not cool that day, right? For, for a dignified man to run was, was absolutely humiliating, but that's what he does. He runs to him, and he embraces him. He literally falls on his neck, which reveals to me God's overwhelming love and the joy he experiences when one of his children returned to him. You see, we spoke about biblical compassion this week. This defines biblical compassion. This is what God does for us. He saw the need in the distance. He was moved by the need. He went to where the problem was, and he got his hands dirty, raising this kid up to a, a higher level of life, bringing him back. He, he literally restores his son. Isn't that amazing? He saw his son's condition. He was moved by the need, and he met him where he was at. How many of you are glad this morning that God met you in your deepest point of need? Hmm. So the son starts to, be, to, to repeat his, his prepared speech. God, I've, or, or Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. But the father kind of cuts him off before he even finishes, reminding us that he's already forgiven him. I've already forgiven you, son. Listen to the way the message version puts it. I love this. So descriptive. It says, when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, he embraced him, and he kissed him. The son started his speech, Father, I've sinned against God, I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to his servants, quick, bring out a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get me a, a calf and we'll roast it. We're going to party. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here. He was given up for dead and now alive. Given up for lost and he's now found. That's what God says about us when we return to him. They began to have a wonderful time. One thing I, I appreciate about this story, one thing I don't see is that the father didn't wait to see how that son might behave. He didn't make him earn his way back. He restored him immediately. That's what God does for us. He restores us. He puts a robe on him, proof of acceptance back into the family, restored relationship and identity, the ring which says, hey, you can speak in my name, you can buy in my name, you can act in my name. Yes. Sandals that talk about honor and respect in his household. The father restores his son. I hope you guys have been making application as we go along, but I want to give you a little more application this morning. The first part, rebellion. He gathered all he had and 
went to a faraway country. Then he squandered it all on loose living, and he finds himself in a pig pen. You see, I believe we start moving in the wrong direction when we start valuing things over people. We start moving in the wrong direction when we start valuing things over God. The younger son valued his earthly inheritance as, as, as more over his relationship with his father. Another thing I want to remind us of is that the far country exists. It's not necessarily a faraway place as much as it is a place in our hearts. I believe it exists, and I know it existed in my heart. That younger son just dreamed of a of freedom far away from home, and then he acted on it. He went to a faraway place. He, he broke his father's heart in rebellion. And that what sin does to us, it kind of plants that seed and says, ooh, this looks good. The last thing is life in the far country is not always what we expect. Eventually his resources diminished, his friends disappeared, there were nowhere to be found, and he finds himself in a pig pen begging for food. Life in the far country is not always what we expect. Joe, you did a phenomenal job talking about David and sin, right? He dreamed of life in a faraway country also, right? He saw Bathsheba on the roof, and he acted on it. This young man saw life in the faraway country, freedom, and, and he acted on it. You see, sin promises enjoyment, but really what it brings is enslavement, doesn't it? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. It promises life, but the reality of it, Paul tells us in Romans that the wages of sin is death, isn't it? Sin promises success, but really all it does is bring failure to us. Sin will always take you farther than you want to go. This young man ended up in a pig pen. He ended up in a pig pen. But I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have a change of mind. Isn't that what that young man did? He came to himself. He, he changed his mind. Essentially what he did was he repented. Tony Evans defines repentance this way. I love Tony Evans. I wish I could say it like he would say it. He says the word repent means to change the mind in order to reverse direction. It involves turning from sin. It's like traveling the wrong way on a highway and deciding to reverse course. You exit, cross over the overpass and enter on ramps going the other way. It's a change of direction. He found himself in a pig pen and he came to himself. He recognized that, that, that even, even service at his father's home was better than freedom in the far country or freedom in the far country. It's not really freedom, is it? Sin often holds us captive. There are a couple things I want, to, I want you to recognize here. The fact that it's, it's God's goodness, not just our badness that leads us to repentance. We serve a good, good father. I want you to recognize this morning that God often uses those desperate, sometimes painful moments to wake us up. Because Kyle Eidelman in his book, Aha, says it this way, only when things start to fall apart do we finally open our eyes. You want scripture to back it up? Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly grief re produces repentance that leads to salvation with, without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. No turning back. The way I look at it is this. Difficult moments often lead to godly grief, leading to repentance and restoration. This guy, Kyle Eidelman, did this Facebook survey as he was preparing to um, write his book. And it, he, he asked his friends to fill in the blank. I stopped running from God when blank. I stopped running from God when blank. Listen to this. This is just a couple of them. I stopped running from God when it was clear I'd made a mess of things. I stopped running from God when I hit rock bottom. I stopped running from God when she filed for divorce. I stopped running from God when people found out my secret. I stopped running from God when I was fired or where I had, when I had nowhere else to go. Why is it that it always takes a pig pen experience for us to recognize where we're at? Why is that? I mean, it happens to all of us, but why is that? My encouragement to us this morning is to keep that word repentance in mind. Difficult moments lead to godly grief, which often, hopefully, leads to repentance and then rejoicing or restoration. Rejoicing, he came to his father. You see, the father is simply a picture of God's attitude towards those who 
kind of turn their lives around and head back to him. He's rich in grace and mercy and love towards those who repent. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, it's a little long. Bear with me, but this describes the prodigal son and really us to a T. A lot of hope packed in the scripture. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, but the Father, but God, but the Father, he, he said, hey, put the best robe on him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. But God, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, that Father never stopped looking out over the horizon to see if his son was coming back home made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. Somebody should say amen to that. By grace, you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace, that young man said, I want to be be one of your hired servants. I I want to earn back my position as your son. Listen to what Paul says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. You can't work it back. It's a gift from God. It's not a result of works. It's not a result of what you can do so that no one may boast, because we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. All this through the sacrifice of his son Jesus. We're saved by his grace. There's a, there's a story of these um, two pastors who went down south for a, a men's conference. It's a pretty cool story. It's actually pretty funny. And one of the pastors had never been down south before, so after staying a night in a hotel, they went out for breakfast from one of these places down south. And uh, pastors order their food. The one pastor had never been down there gets this this plate, and he says, there's this white, mushy-looking stuff on my plate. What was it? Grits. So the waitress came by, and he asked her, "What, what is this? And she's like, it's grits. He said, man, I didn't order grits and I'm not paying for it. The waitress said, sir, down here, you don't order it, you don't pay for it, you just get it. Isn't that just like the grace of God? We didn't order it, we didn't pay for it, we just get it. Listen, we're going to wrap it up in just a couple of minutes, but everything the son wanted in that far country, everything the son desired in that far country he found at home, I want to remind you today that everything you desire in the far country, you can find at home in Jesus. He found clothes. He found jewelry. He found friends. He found celebration. He found love. He found hope for the future. The difference was he went from, Father, give me my inheritance to, Father, make me. That was the difference. But still the Father didn't make him earn his forgiveness. He went from uh, from experiencing misery in the far country to mercy, the mercy of a loving father. He gave him a robe, a ring, threw him a party. He deserved a funeral, but he got a feast. That's what God gives us. Let's read this scripture, Psalm chapter 103, verses 10 to 14. I love this, and with this, we'll pretty much wrap it up. It says, he does not deal with us according to our sins. How many of you are thankful for that? No repay us for our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Listen to this. As as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He knows we're weak. He remembers that we're dust. God in his compassion towards us, I want to remind you today that it meets us where we are. That father came running to his son, and the father comes running to us to meet us where we are. He did it in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. Allow me to remind you of that this morning. God loves you. God's love and grace towards us is immeasurable. You know what he said to his son? Hey, before you behave, you belong. And that's what God says to us. You belong to me. God's love and grace towards us is never failing. You know, I could count... (laughs) A million times where my parents had one of those talks with me. 
I wonder how often God has those talks with us. And it's like, God, will you ever stop? Will you ever just like, like leave me to my, my mess ups, my mistakes? There was a cartoon in the New Yorker magazine that showed an exasperated father saying to his prodigal son, this is the fourth time we've killed this fattened calf. <laughs> isn't it amazing and isn't it the truth that God does that over and over and over and over again. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray this morning. Pastor Lowry, worship team, would you join me? If you would. Hey, I don't know what you're feeling this morning. I don't know who this message was for and what part, excuse me, but I believe there's somebody here who's just like that prodigal son who finds themselves in maybe a pig pen, maybe a difficult place. And God's challenge to us today is to simply turn around. God's not asking you to stop running. What he's asking you to do is to turn around and run back to him. Believe me when I tell you he'll meet you halfway. Maybe today you just need to feel the love of the father, just like that young man felt the his father fell on his neck. I want you to know God wants to embrace you today. Mm. You know, the prodigal was lost. You know what Jesus says? I am the way. The prodigal was a little ignorant. You know what Jesus says? I am the truth. The prodigal was, was dead. He was dead in his trespasses. He was dead in his sin. Jesus says, I'm the life. Somebody needs to be reminded of that this morning. Let's pray. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time you give us to meet together, to share your word together, and to unpack a story that has so much meaning to me, so much meaning to us. Father, thank you for the reminder that you love us immeasurably. Your grace towards us is scandalous. It doesn't make sense. But you love us anyway. Father, I pray, God, that this day you would help us to feel, would you just embrace us? Would you remind us of that love you have for us? Thank you, God, for not making us earn it. We couldn't do it. We couldn't earn it back. You give it to us. You give us your grace. Father, thank you for your compassion that meets us in our deepest point of need this morning. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. The worship team wants to dedicate this song to those of you in whom the Holy Spirit is speaking to today through Pastor Ernie. I have this picture in my mind of someone holding on to a bar with dear life, just holding on. And the Spirit of God, through the message, is saying, let go. Just, just, just let go. Just let go. It's going to be all right. But I'll fall. Just let go. But I, but I can't stay right. Just, just let go. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So if Ernie was talking to you, I want you to acknowledge it. Not, not to us, but to God. And I want you to pray with me. You may say this internally or out loud, but just say this with me. Say, oh Lord, I find it difficult to let go. But the fact of the matter is, you are talking to me. And so like a child, I surrender to you. And I give up the fight. I release myself 
into your hands. And if you're saying to yourself, but, but I'm afraid, God says, I know, and that's okay. If you're like the prodigal son and you're coming home really because you're desperate, he says, that's okay. I got you. And I'm restoring you back to where you fell from. For you are my son. You are my daughter. And nothing that you've gone through has been a surprise to me. I knew when you left, I knew what you were doing, and I love you. So Lord, here we are. We come to you. We surrender to you. Thank you, Jesus. stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand you stood before my failure 